Last week, it was reported Rihanna turned down the opportunity to perform at the 2019 Super Bowl because she didn't agree with the way the NFL has treated Colin Kaepernick. Her declination was a way of supporting him and other players who have chosen to kneel during games. Following Rihanna were a few other folks who also declined the offer to perform, including Amy Schumer. I initially read this news in Angela Helms' article for The Root. And as I did, Helms expressed suspicion after reading about Schumer following in Rihanna's footsteps. Like many of us, she was leery based on centuries of experiencing white women pretending to be on the same page for the same cause, only to later betray us. And she also mulled over the history of white women calling the police on us just for existing among them while black. I think it's obvious why any rational person would side-eye Schumer's actions. Even though this reaction of suspicion seems logical to me, there were a lot of folks in the social media realm, mostly black, suggesting black folks should just pipe down, accept the help, and thank Schumer heartily for her service. I was highly disappointed with what I read. Look, it's good Amy Schumer turned down the Super Bowl, though I've never seen a comedian perform at a bowl, and I have no idea what exactly they were asking her to do. Nonetheless, allegedly aiming to stand in solidarity with Colin Kaepernick is a good thing. However, the fact Schumer turned down a potential Super Bowl gig in the interest of supporting what is ultimately a black cause doesn't make her an ally. And that's because there are no allies. And I know, I know, I'm saying something that seems untrue, and how dare I? What are we to call the non-black folks who have marched with us, boycotted with us, and spoken up to their friends about the social inequalities that oppress us? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. I prefer to call them decent human beings, which is what every person should strive to be. To me, there is no prize for being a decent human being who lives on the side of what is right and reasonable. I mean, I get up each day, work a full shift, make dinner much of the time, try to involve myself in my community to some degree, help my bonus baby with homework, and I work to interact lovingly with my partner. And for this, I don't receive monetary bonuses. There's no Ed McMahon type walking up to my door and telling me I won the human being sweepstakes. And when I walk out the door in the morning, there are no people running up to me to roll out the red carpet and toss rose petals at my feet for being so decent. None of that happens because these are things I should do. When we live in a society that makes us overly grateful for mediocrity, it just goes to show the way privilege for some and deprivation for others can make a regular old saltine taste like a Ritz, a la Eddie Murphy. Using the word ally implies white folks are doing us a favor by being good humans, when good humans is what they should be striving to be anyway. Where I come from, there is no trophy for being regular. So to haul that hullabaloo, I say ally schmally. I'm Malika Rogers, and that's This Week in Fuckery. Ready? Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Tackling Tomfoolery podcast. I'm Malika Rogers, and today's episode will have three really super special guests. I have Chioko Grievous, Tamara Kellum, who has been a guest on the show before, and then in a separate interview for today's episode, I will have Raquel Jones. Um, Chioko Grievous is founder of the Juliet Health Organization and the Sacramento Black Women's Health and Wellness Conference. She has over 10 years in public health, community health education, and program implementation at the state and local level. She spearheaded programs for infant mortality prevention, breastfeeding support, women's health disparities, and autism awareness. Choco has a vast knowledge of public health program implementation and conducting community needs assessments. Through the Juliet Health Organization, she is leading the way in providing innovative interventions that assist in black women and women of color to empower themselves by consciously choosing to be healthier and thrive and by seeking health resources for positive health outcomes. Choco is also a mother to a nine-year-old son named Alex 
and she's married to a man named Daniel. She's a yogi and loves the Boston Celtics. And I guess nobody's perfect. Somebody has to love the Celtics. Um, again, we have Tamara Kellum, who is a transformational wellness coach, a certified personal trainer, a behavior change specialist, and a group exercise leader who lost over 100 pounds through diet, exercise, and a transformed outlook on life. Her journey began at the age of 19 in a homeless shelter for pregnant teens. Fifteen years later, Tamara is using her story to inspire and empower others to transform their lives. And then also, again, we have Raquel Jones. Um, she's a an LS, LC, LCSW psychotherapist in New York and New Jersey. She's the founder and director of Transforming Lives Counseling Service, which is a private therapy practice dedicated to helping women and girls of color, particularly black women and girls, to achieve mental health wellness and to live their best life. She's been a therapist for over 30 years. She's worked in outpatient mental health and substance abuse clinics throughout her career. And her last job before starting her private practice was as the clinical supervisor as an, at an outpatient substance abuse clinic in New York City. She founded Transforming Lives Counseling Service in 2016 to offer therapy to people who feel they're not understood or heard by other therapists. She works primarily with people with anxiety, childhood trauma, PTSD, body dysmorphia, and binge eating. In addition to her master's in social work, she's also a certified trauma therapist. So obviously today, I brought my heavy hitters. Let's get into it. So, Tamara and Jeffield, what do you do to get and keep your mind right? Um, I know for me, it's been, oh, I think I've grown into it because I never thought about self-care as like a practice, but recently I've been journaling a lot, Mm -hmm. like a lot. And I, I try to like get away, like where I just take a few minutes in the car (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> or I go to a beach or something, which isn't practical all the time, but I, I noticed that journaling has helped me out quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you ever share what you write? With or my you- therapist. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So that's <laughs> another thing that you do. Um, yes, that is another thing. Therapist. I see her, I see her every week faithfully. Nice. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, girl, please. Like, there'll be times when I'm like, can you fit me in? I need to talk. Like, <laughs> I'm so used to going and seeing her mm-hmm. that um, it's just been really, really helpful. So there are times when she'll say, bring your journal in, like, if you don't mind sharing what you've written. And sometimes mm-hmm. I'm going off. Like, I can see my, <laughs> like, the strokes of my pen, like, <laughs> bleeding through paper. Um and so that's been really helpful. I know when I was a, like younger, I wrote in my journal all the time when I had nothing going on. Mm-hmm. Like I would, I would faithfully write in and it could be things like, oh, see, I had a test. I mean, like from the time I was probably nine consistently until I was in my early twenties mm-hmm. and then late, like I just kind of stopped doing it when I do have stuff to talk about. So, so when you need to talk, that's when you journal less. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I can relate to that. Right. So Tam, for you, how do you you keep your mind right? Well, man, um, what I, the method that I would use changes depending on the situation. It it has changed over the years. Um, at some, at certain points in my life, it's been therapy at other points. It's been journaling. Um, for about a year or so, I was journaling affirmations quite regularly, mm. heavily. Um, and I think that dedicating myself to that practice really repatterned and reprogrammed my mind so that I don't face the types of depression and anxiety um, to the degree that I used to. I mean, hardly ever now. Uh, mm. Um, I think right now what I do to kind of maintain 
my well-being, my mental well-being is I make self-care a priority. Mm-hmm. And that means I say no. That means I rest when my body says to rest. It means that I don't force myself to be around people that I don't want to be around just because I feel obligated to be around them. <laughs> it means I delegate responsibilities to people mm-hmm. when I can and and, um, and really just honor what I need from moment to moment so that I'm not overwhelming myself or not being true to myself um, and overwhelming, overburdening myself. Mm-hmm. So Chiyoko, what does self-care look like for you? It could be really basic sometimes. I think a lot of people, when they think about self-care, they're thinking about massages and getting their hair done or whatnot. But for me, it's just been basic, basic things that I can do every day. Mm -hmm. So like the journaling is a time for me to do self-care or seeing a therapist is something I can do um, for self-care. Sleeping extra 30 minutes is something that I could do for self-care. I like to try to say that I go to the gym for self-care. That's a lie. I can't stand the gym. Um, (laughs) But like, you know, I think driving an extra block for me is self-care. So it's just trying to sneak in things that aren't really typical, but it could be like, I need to hear the rest of this song. I need to hear the rest of this podcast. So I'm going to take an extra way around just so I can clear my mind Mm -hmm. and get my mind together. So I think a lot of times people are like, I can't practice self-care. It's so expensive. It's because they're thinking about the massages and they're thinking right. about that like vacation like I'm gonna take a weekend getaway like not everybody can do that so it's about trying to find things in your own like surroundings and your current environment that you can do to practice self-care so awesome thank you for sharing that that's that's a good thing I think I, I agree with you where it's often um assume that self-care has to be something that's extra dramatic or extra expensive or extra time consuming and sometimes self-care can be something that you get in in three or four minutes you know it could just be I'm just gonna sit in this office or this (laughs) cubicle and I'm just gonna breathe for the Mm -hmm. next three minutes Mm -hmm. I'm close my eyes I'm clear my head and I'm gonna take some deep breath Mm -hmm. Um, for me I'm weird i I am a Fitbit user Mm -hmm. and um, a lot of times I don't leave the office for lunch because I don't want to spend money Um, even though um, sometimes DoorDash gets me caught up. But um, (laughs) (laughs) as often as possible, I try to make sure I bring my lunch and I kind of hang around the office at lunch to avoid being wasteful. And so one thing I do because I am in the office so much of the day is I just walk in my cubicle. And sometimes that is like the greatest stress reliever. Like I'm, I'm moving my body, my heart rate's elevated. I'm letting out any kind of tension. I might roll my shoulders, take deep breaths, walk in place or walk in the inside of my cubicle. But that always makes me feel better. And most of the time I do it at least once an hour just to keep myself from losing it or from, yeah. from sometimes being really, if I'm really tired that day, if I get up and start moving, kind of rejuvenates me and it takes my mind off whatever it is, takes my eyes off that screen and lets me, you know, do something to get my head together so yeah definitely self-care can be all kinds of inexpensive or totally free things um like writing in a journal or walking in a cubicle or uh, walking outside or breathing Um, so chioko i recently attended Your event. So. You did. I saw you. I saw it when, I, when you walked up. I said, What? I'm so, I'm so happy to see her. Yes. We won't talk about my struggle for arriving there, but um, <laughs> you are 
the founder of the Sacramento Black Women's Health and Wellness Conference. And I want you to talk a little bit about that, please. Tell the listeners like what it is, what inspired you to get the conference started. You started it with your with your good friend. Yes, with my good friend. So, um, oh gosh, I I love this conference so much. And it's crazy because when I talk about it, I'm like, I hope I don't sound like one of those people like, oh, it's the best thing ever. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's, it's seriously, like, I think it's so great because every year it just keeps getting better and better. And like, um, so it, the conference is a space for women to learn about how to access health care and to take priority or let their health be a priority to them and optimize um, just their great health and, and mental health awareness and physical health. And um, that's pretty much a conference. What the conference is, is about optimizing your best health. And um, we noticed that there's just been so many people who have contracted diseases or they have been diagnosed with chronic illnesses when it doesn't have to be. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think a lot of times we hear the narrative of it just runs in our family. So that's just what it is. And it's like, that's not what it has to be. So um, my grandma died when she was 62 um, and she had diabetes and heart failure or congestive heart failure and renal failure, um, hypertension. And it wasn't that she didn't have the money or the insurance, but it was about the access. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's what happens to a lot of black women, um, is that it has nothing to do with the insurance. So now we have the affordable care act, um, and people have, you know, insurance, but they, they're still not having the access. So there's a, there's a gap there. And so I feel like my job is to kind of, um, merge that gap or fill in that gap by people seeing practitioners that look like them and talking with them and normalizing things like therapy, um, talking about sexual health openly, um, will be helpful and it'll give them some power or empower them to make healthier choices for themselves. Um, and I, you know, my grandma didn't have that opportunity. And so I've sat with that for a long time and it was kind of just doing that whole thing of what is the best way to serve her or to honor her and to serve others. And so my grandma was really about, socializing like she was a social butterfly she loved people um and i i really think that you know if given the opportunity she would have loved to have been here still and so um i just i want to provide a space for people that is all inclusive and it doesn't matter what your shape size is it doesn't matter what you're wearing we keep the ticket prices low um I just really want people to feel, come to a space where they feel safe um, to receive information and to meet people where they're at and um, not be preachy towards them, but just to provide the resources and you, you do with it, whatever you want to do with it. So Jessica, my friend and I, Brown, she's, she's, we're just like-minded in the sense and we came together and created this conference and it's, it's been three years. It's, it was one of those things where we were just hoping it would work (laughs) the first year and it worked and we were like, Oh my gosh, that got a, a really good response. Um, and so we're just really honored to be able to do it and that people, um, people keep coming back and inviting people and telling others about it and, um, yeah, it's just been really good for me to do it. And that's self-care for me too. So it just works all the way around. We all benefit from it. So. Well, it's yeah. an awesome event. And last year I wanted to go and something happened along the way and I, I didn't get to come. And this year I was like, no, 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 I'm going, I'm going this year. And I remember seeing you at an event. I think I was working, you were working and you told me you'd only give me a shirt for the conference. If I agree to come this year and I was like, yeah, I'm coming. And, you know, I was lying. 
Um, <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted the shirt, and and I didn't want you to be mad. Um, but that's just, <laughs> you know, I get, uh, you know, I have some social anxiety weirdness about mm-hmm. myself, and so that's why I was like, oh, I mean, it sounds so awesome. I want to go, but mm, I don't know. I was thinking mm-hmm. I need to bring like two, three friends so I won't <laughs> feel weird. But I ended up uh, coming by myself. You I knew did. People. I knew people I knew would be there, you know, so I figured, well, I won't really be by myself because I'll have people, you know, in the building. And I also, that the week leading up to your event was a terrible week for me. Terrible. Mm. And the level of stress I was carrying um, when I got there was almost the cause of me not going at all. You know, I was just like, man, I just, this is too much. I got too much going on. This week has been a mess. My whole situation is a mess. I don't want to go. And um, I had a long talk with a friend um, the night before. And I was like, I don't think I'm going. I just, and she was like, just put your clothes on and just come on. And even that morning, I was like, man, I think I'm going to just stay here in the bed. And she was like, I expect to see you. So last minute, no joke, I think you told me to be there at like, I don't know, 830, whatever it is you told yeah. me. And I got there not at 830. I got there like 30 minutes later. <laughs> But you made it. But you but made, made it. it. And let me tell you, I'm so, so glad Yay. I went. I'm so glad I went. It was exactly what I needed. And I ended up um, at the beginning when everybody sort of, you know, congregated in one room, I ended up sitting next to a woman and just sort of spilling what had been happening to me that week to this woman. And we have it. And it was like a professional issue. So we're having this conversation about what was going on. And just I talk with that woman who I don't know at all and still don't know was the start of me feeling better about what I experienced. And the whole idea of being in a room with all those other black women and the idea of getting to talk about the things that we often don't talk about regarding our mm-hmm. mental health and our physical health and ways to care for ourselves and to advocate for ourselves was so, so good. So um, anyway, your, your conference is awesome. I'm glad you're doing it. Maybe one day I will bust up in that shit and talk <laughs> in public. Yeah. I might. I mean, there's a possibility. I don't mind public speaking. I just am weird about attending things sometimes. Just right. I'm a little strange, but... Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that that's so, so, so okay. yeah, I think it's great that you, like, that's, that you said that, that makes me feel really good, and because there's times when, like, your friends and your family will be like, girl, you did that, that was so good, like, they just celebrate you because they're your friends and family, like, no one's gonna say, like, that, that shit was whack, no one's gonna say that, but the, when I hear it from people like you that I know, but we're, we're not close. Like you're, you're someone that I've met recently. Mm -hmm. And then like, I'll hear it from people who I just see out in the street, like, Oh, you're the girl that puts on the conference. Mm -hmm. Do you remember me? I went and I started seeing a therapist because you guys were like, I got a therapist. And I was like, (laughs) well, I need to get me one. Like it's like a social status thing or something. I don't know. it's really neat to like hear that and be able to sit in that. And that makes me feel like I'm doing my job. Like I'm doing what I'm supposed to do and I'm doing something that my grandma would be proud of. And, and that's how we both feel Jessica and I is that we are, we are really trying to, you know, make this difference where people just see things or see themselves differently and see how they fit into this whole spectrum. Like we have the right to have health access. Mm -hmm. Like that's our right. That's our fundamental right. And so when someone's telling, not giving us all the information or they're treating us differently or, um, you know, like, like for example, prep, you know, like for HIV prevention, like black women don't know about prep. 
this has been on the market since 2012. Why don't, why aren't we knowing about PrEP? This is something that could potentially save so many lives, but we don't know about those things. And you have to have an inside track to know about those things. That is, that's unbelievable. So I'm tired of it. And so (laughs) that's why I do it. It's just out of outrage and, (laughs) and it's, it's, it's fueling me to keep going. So. Well, awesome. I'm glad you're, you're doing it. Now, Tamara, you also have an event coming up. I mean, you have done a few events surrounding like mental and physical health and kind of self-image, self-esteem. So you have something coming up. Tell us about what you have coming up. Well, I'm still kind of contemplating uh, what, you know, I'm 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 finalizing it, but um, right now it's the mind body exchange and it's really a workshop delving into how, uh, our minds influence, uh, our bodies mm-hmm. and how we can actually transform our bodies by transforming, um, our thought process and really tapping into and harnessing the power of our minds, our conscious and subconscious, and also, kind of untangling and doing away with the weeds uh, that can kind of strangle us, you know, those subconscious uh, beliefs um, that hinder us from achieving uh, our vision of health and wellness, mind, body, and spirit, because it's a, it's a, I have a very holistic view of health and wellness and fitness, very, po- very body positive, um, and making sure that it's not, focus on aesthetics, but really total whole well-being, mind, body, and spirit. That's awesome. Yeah. I wish I could just book a flight for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's awesome because I, w- so I was recently on a panel, uh, self-care for women of color. Mm-hmm. And the, the organization who put it together, it's called Woke Work. And it was established by a black woman, of course, because <laughs> we're just so fucking amazing and doing so many amazing things. You better know it. Mm-hmm. Um, and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pretty much. And she approached me and she said, listen, um, you know, I want to have this series of events for uh, women of color, specifically professional women, uh, because we tend to neglect ourselves the most. Mm-hmm. And um, but it's open to everyone, men and women. Um, of course, the target demographic is women of color. But she said, if you ever want to use my space for anything, just let me know. Give wow. me thirty days notice, and you got it. Wow. And I, said, I said, well, <laughs> <laughs> and I think the only the only stipulation is that you know these, not that it's a stipulation for me, but you know. Um, it's it's that the events are free because it's meant to be a gift to the community. So um, I'm I, I, I'm I'm happy to collaborate with anyone and well nearly every, anyone. <laughs> yeah, because you do got to be careful. I'm learning now. I can't yeah. say yes to everything. You got to be right. careful who you collaborate with. You know, sure, right? right. Shit. <laughs> so and that's care. Self care. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Mm-hmm. You can't um, put with everybody. Have, people yeah. will really exploit your desire to contribute and to be of value to others and to help. And um, yeah, they re- they really will exploit you. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? They'll you, they'll put your name on stuff that ain't got. It's like what? I didn't say that. So <laughs> right. Um, yeah, but but this is it's a great opportunity to just kind of because uh, I consider the work that I do more so a movement than anything else. And if I can contribute to a paradigm shift, if I can transform our narratives around health and wellness and um, make it so that we, so that our idea of fitness and health and well-being is broader and includes all kinds of body types and all ethnicities and, you know, and, and, and we, we don't neglect the mental aspect of it, the emotional health. We don't neglect, you know, our spiritual well-being, whatever that looks like for you. If I can contribute to that in any way, uh, if that's the legacy that I leave behind, then I'm happy to do that. 
I just in um the episode that aired this week. I um we talked about cliches, um cliches that black people tend to um parrot and perpetuate that are absolute bullshit. And mm. one of the ones I addressed was black don't crack. Mm. And mm. Although melanin keeps us looking fresh and young, most of us on the outside, mm. on the inside, especially for black women, we are cracked the fuck up. Um, it's hypertension, it's diabetes, it's heart disease, it's all kinds of other stress related illnesses, it's obesity, it's, you know, whatever it is on the inside is a whole ass cracked up mess. And so sometimes when we talk about black don't crack, we get so caught up in the, oh, I look 10 years younger than what I actually am, that we feel like we don't have to address what's happening on the inside. We feel like our mental health or our, um, you know, efforts to maintain some level of fitness are not important because on the outside... I'm 50, but I look 40. Yeah, Mm -hmm. but on the inside, you're 68. And so Mm -hmm. that's a problem. And so that was one of the cliches that I wanted to bust up because it's Mm -hmm. important that we're honest with ourselves about our health, about our mental health, and about our physical health, about our spiritual health, about our emotional health. It's imperative that we're that we pay as much attention to that, that we put as much effort and energy into that as we put into our, on the outside, I look cute. I look good for 44. You know, I look good for 60. We have to do more than just think about what it looks like on the outside. And um, part of, I think, what drives that, cliche that stereotype to continue about us is this sort of idea of the strong black woman right yeah Mm -hmm. so strong we're so resilient and a lot of times we listen to that and we take that to heart in a way that ends up damaging us long term so Chioko have you ever fallen victim to sort of that trope of the the strong black woman Um, I would say yes. I think that, um, so when I, you know, I first had my son, he's 10 now, I was 25 and I was a single mom and I was working full time and I had him and he would have preschool and I'd have to work and then I would be doing stuff at the school and, um, cooking meals and inviting people over and everyone would just compliment me on, oh, how, you know, how you just fight through adversity by, <laughs> by being a single yeah. mom. And um, I would be celebrated and I would always just be like, well, that's what I'm supposed to because I'm his mother. But what was happening was, is I realized I was start I was putting on a front about all the things that I, that I was able to do, but I was breaking inside. Mm -hmm. Like I was, Mm -hmm. I was tired. I was, um, frustrated. I was sad. Um, I was lonely. Um, I was scared. I mean, so there were all kinds of different emotions that were happening in the inside, but on the outside, it was like, oh, she has it together. Like, you Mm -hmm. know, she has this child, she's a single mom, she's Mm -hmm. working, she's doing all these things, but it was killing me. I was having a really hard time with it. So yeah. Mm-hmm. That's interesting because when I thought of examples, I thought about my single motherhood experience as well. I think that's a really big uh, subject, for, especially specifically for Black women, and kind of feeling like you have to be strong. Mm-hmm. Um, I think one because we're a matriarchal culture, and two. Um, there's just a lot of pressure on us to, and there has been since uh, the slavery, er, slavery era and post-slavery era, 
to uphold our families, um, to uphold the black man, to, mm -hmm. you know, hold, hold, hold down our households, hold down our families. I think some of that is just genetic memory, mm -hmm. uh, intergenerational mm -hmm. stuff that just gets passed down. So. Yeah. I know for, for me, I, I think the time when I most was trying to embody that ridiculous idea was when I was married um, to my ex-husband. And I was super young. I was 25. Uh, I was, we had a baby and I was raised, you know, in a pretty staunchly religious household. So I'm trying to apply all these church principles and all these ideals about what black women do and don't so cultural principles and religious principles to my life and this marriage and this parenting situation, right? So I'm doing everything, you know, I'm working all day, I'm pregnant, I'm tired. And then I come home, I cook, I clean. I, you know, I was the, the bill payer, really. Um, mm -hmm. I take the money and pay all the bills and I'd grocery shop because he didn't like to go to the grocery store. Like, who does? I hate the store with a passion. But I did the grocery <laughs> shopping and the errand running and the, you know, and I was fully convinced at that age that's what I was supposed to do, right? This is what, this is what a good woman does. This is what a Proverbs, what is that, 31 woman does or what? <laughs> oh, you God. Know, that's the dumbass <laughs> shit I thought was the case, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, had baby, we lost our child when she was four months old. And at that point, I still thought I'm a strong black woman. Everything mm -hmm. happens for a reason. I am sad that I lost my child, but I'm sure there's a greater purpose. Blah, blah, blah. So on, so on. Cliche, cliche. And that is how I was operating. And people were saying, oh, you're so strong. There were people who knew me who appeared outwardly more torn up than I was. Mm. And it wasn't that I wasn't torn up. I was raggedy as fuck on the inside. But on the outside, I thought I had to perpetuate this strong black Christian wife woman, you know, persona. That was what I thought was necessary. And so, you know, as time passed and I got a little bit wiser, I realized what I was, I was just damaging myself. I was not doing myself any favors. And that in, at that time, and in those initial phases of my grieving and loss, that's when I needed to be the most selfish. And I know we just, um, it's, it's not really that it's selfish in the negative sense, but that's when I needed to spend the most time focused on me and how I felt and what I was going through, what I was dealing with, what I lost. And instead of doing that in that moment, I'm holding it together because that's what strong black women do. And everybody says how strong I am and they're right. Look how strong I am. Mm -hmm. But I was a mess on the inside. And I think it probably took about it was probably about two years later before I realized I have permission to feel shitty. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I, you know, I cried every day and all of that initially. I was sad. You know, I, I definitely was going through some emotional changes without question. I was grieving, but I didn't give I didn't give myself, you know, full permission to feel the weight of all of it until about two years later when I was no longer married. No, you know, and it had nothing to do with him. He wasn't keeping me from doing that. It was just I, you know, just was perpetuating what I'd been told and what I'd been made to believe about how black women are supposed to behave and we're strong, right? So things happen to us, but we just buck up and we just move on. 
And no, we don't. We do not. And I mean, I would have been a prime candidate for some hypertension stroke, you know, whatever, had I just kept going the mm-hmm. way I was going, trying to prove a point of being strong when I should have just, you know, if I felt like it laid on the carpet and cried and curled up in a ball, if that's what I felt like doing. Mm-hmm. So um, I've had several conversations, unfortunately, over the years with other women who have lost babies. And um, I wouldn't say it's my ministry, so to speak, but I, when I see it happen to someone I know, I definitely reach out because I understand that loss. And one of the first things I tell people is, however you're feeling, feel that way and don't apologize to anybody for that shit. If you are feeling sad, pissed off, disgusted, whatever it is, go ahead and feel that thing until it's over. Because that's part of your grieving process and don't let anybody take that away from you and don't feel like being a strong Black woman should prevent you from doing those things. If you're sad and you feel like crying and you're at work, Uh you're at a meeting, whatever, go to the restroom and and go ahead and ball your eyes out until you're done. And then you come back to the meeting. It's okay. But make sure you give yourself the permission to feel, to process, to be vulnerable. Um, I think we don't always allow ourselves that. And that's how we end up with our mental and emotional issues taking a toll on us physically. You know, because we don't let ourselves just be however we are in that moment. If you're depressed you're depressed. You don't have to stay there forever, but if that's how you're feeling, go ahead and feel that. Right. You know, so we, we don't, we don't grant ourselves that grace as often as we should. And like I said, I think a lot of it has to do with that idea of us being strong and abnormally resilient. And that's so damaging mm-hmm. to us. And it takes away our humanity you know, um, those emotions are what make us people. You know, we cease to be people when people just think of us as pillars of strength and nothing else. We cease to be people. And we can't mm-hmm. allow, you know, someone to take that humanity from us or for ourselves, for, for, for us to take it from ourselves. You know, it's not something we can afford to do. I think that subconsciously we do it right like you don't even realize that you're doing it until you sit back and you cognitively are like wait a minute I don't have to do this you know like I feel like every day even at work or something like the emotional side like I have coworkers that cry all the damn time Mm -hmm. I'm like girl like what like (laughs) What? Why are you crying? But it's acceptable because that person is feeling sad or they're upset about something. But if I started to cry, Mm -hmm. what would the response be? Right? It would. Mm -hmm. So I think that we we shield a lot of that because it's like we've been taught that you just have to keep moving. Mm -hmm. So no matter what the circumstance, no matter losing a child, losing a loved one, you go to work the next day. Mm-hmm. because you don't want anybody to think that you're weak and we're, we're just that's what's ingrained in us to do which is very very unfortunate and you don't realize that you're doing it until like you said like something internally just breaks right mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. we have to got to stop doing that because we're doing so much damage to ourselves that way um, now, Tamara, I know that sometimes you meditate. I don't know if it's something you daily, if you do it occasionally. I just know that it's something you do. Um, how have you found um, it to be transformative? What is it? What really does it do for you? Um, so a lot of studies have been done on the effects of meditation on the brain. And there is... A, scientific evidence to support that it changes your brain it neutralizes your neural pathways Mm -hmm. so uh essentially we have two minds 
we have our, our limbic system, our, our reptilian brain, which houses our emotional memories, and that's responsible for like fight and flight and freeze and all of that. Uh, so as humans evolved, we developed uh, an additional part of our brain called the neocortex, which is like the frontal lobe. And neo stands for new because it's actually a, a newer part of the brain, <laughs> of the human brain that hasn't always been there. And that's where a lot of our cognitive uh, processes and functions take place. And so there is uh, your optic nerves have links to both parts of your brain. There's a link from your eye to the limbic system, or uh, uh, and then there's a link from your eye to like a, a, a part of your neocortex, and the link to when you see something, it hits your limbic limbic system faster than it hits your your neocortex. Mm -hmm. So what happens is that we will pick up on something, and it'll uh, invoke an emotional response before we even get to process what it is we saw. Mm -hmm. And that, what happens is, what the brain fires, so I, I it's so, it's, this is so uh, interesting to me. I just uh, watched a training on unconscious bias and how the brain forms connections and um, and how, the, how we look for patterns. And I remembered this phrase in the training. He said, what the brain fires together, it wires together. So if we make an association, um, fire hot, bam, <laughs> right? Every right. That, that, so that what that firing off went that with that the brain fired off uh, when those two associations took place, and it wires that way and it stays that way. But the same happens when we experience trauma, mm -hmm. uh, when we experience abuse or anything bad, even. Uh, as an infant, there may be things that you experienced as trauma that maybe on the outside are, were not so traumatic, but it stays in your, in your limbic system. Your, it stays in your emotional storehouse, memory storehouse. And so what happens is people who are subjected to repeated traumas, and, and I would say even um, as, a, as, a, as a person of color, if you're not if you were not physically abused or sexually abused, there's still trauma around just being a person of color Absolutely. and, a, you know, you know, racism and all this, a lot of other stuff. I won't go down that rabbit hole, but um, <laughs> there's <laughs> trauma and there's also a uh, genetic memory. Um, there's also trauma that we experience or inherit in the womb, the mm -hmm. stress, stress by uh, our mothers. So, there's a lot of wiring that takes place that can contribute to constantly feeling triggered and not really understanding why. Um, and if your neural pathways are the, if, if, if they were wired to respond a specific way over and over and over and over again, it doesn't matter how positive you try to be. It doesn't matter you, I mean, you can try your best to think positively <laughs> and reframe a situation. The wiring says, nope, we're going to feel bad about this. Mm -hmm. And, um, and when, that's, when that becomes maladaptive, it's called a schema. Mm -hmm. and, and there are different types of schemas. And I learned a lot about this reading this book called Emotional Alchemy, um, what happens, what they found, though, is when you practice mindfulness, which is what meditation is, it resets your, it resets those neural pathways. So I don't know how that is. I don't think anyone understands why or how it works, but they just know that it does. Mm -hmm. And so what I found is as I practice mindfulness, it's, it's, what I've learned about meditation is it's, it's, we tend to think of it as sitting in a, sitting cross-legged on some fancy pillow, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, humming some kind of mantra or something like that. That's not necessarily what it is. It's really just being, uh, it's practicing mindful awareness, which I've kind of learned to do throughout the day. So um, I haven't been as disciplined about, 
as, as disciplined as I'd like to be about sitting in one place and doing and dedicating 10, 15 minutes to it. But it is something that I practice throughout the day. And what I have found is that I don't have the constant triggering that I used to have. And so a lot of the schemas that I used to have, a, a schemas around abandonment, schemas around mistrust, schemas around emotional deprivation that would leave me curled up in a ball that would have me laying in bed for days because that was my body's survival response to stress. Um, I, don't have, I don't have those responses anymore. Um, going back to unconscious bias, the facilitator said they, there was a woman who had tested in this specific region, very, very low in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, identifying uh, unconscious bias. Most people, we have some type of unconscious bias somewhere. It could be towards old people, fat people, black people, white people, men, women. This woman had very, very low scores. And what they found is that she, the reason her scores were so low is because she practiced mindfulness diligently. Mm. Wow. Yeah. There's a lot of science around this. Um, and, and I mean, I can attest to how it has really transformed my own, uh, my life. Hmm. Thank you for, thank you for that. I haven't ever really done it, mm -hmm. uh, but it has been something I've been thinking about for a while now. That's something that I probably need to start incorporating into my day, start um, sort of making it a habit um, mm -hmm. to, to give some time to that. And um, I, I can, I've never heard anything and can never think of any reason not to make that a habit, you know, um, mm -hmm. I've never known anyone who was like, oh, I meditated and it was awful. You know, my life is <laughs> my life is in tatters now because I because I took time for my um I have a, a family member who teaches, I believe it's third grade, and um they do mindfulness in the classroom mm -hmm. most days. And sometimes um she'll video chat with a few of us while she's doing it with the class, so we get to see the effects of it on the children. Um, and mm -hmm. you can see a difference from the time they hit that door coming from lunch and recess until after mindfulness is over. Um, same with my, with my stepkid, um, they would do it in elementary school. She's in junior high now. They don't really do it now, but in elementary school, they would do it. She said, especially like on rainy days, days they couldn't get out for normal recess. Um, they would do it and she loved it. Mm -hmm. um, so I've never known anyone who's engaged and who's been like, this was the dumb idea. I don't know anyone who hasn't <laughs> benefited from trying it. Even people who didn't feel they were the best at it still mm -hmm. came away with a positive experience from trying it. Mm -hmm. Now, um, Chioko, I know you do yoga. Mm -hmm. You're a yogi, and um, <laughs> I I have always I tried yoga uh, uh, one or two times once in a class, and I fell asleep. Um, slightly after the woman <laughs> said, "Don't fall asleep," and then I woke up, and everyone was leaving the classroom. Um, but well, that, that was that was your practice. Man, listen, mm -hmm. I was knocked out. Yeah, and that's Don't what you need. Lay down and breathe. I'm going to sleep. <laughs> Why did you tell me to do that? That's, that's what's so that's awesome it. about yoga because that that was your practice for the day. That's you true. Needed yeah. That. yeah, yeah. I was I, I was a done deal. And then the other times I've done it, I tried it at home, like using um, like Comcast. When they have all these different workouts, you can try and I. Um, did one at home and it was supposed to be for beginners, but it just really, frankly, left me feeling really inadequate and judged mm -hmm. in my own home alone. So um, mm -hmm. I haven't come back to it, but I know you do it, Chioko. And so I always sort of uh, relate yoga sort of to, to meditation because to mm -hmm. me, it is meditation, even mm -hmm. though you are 
working out, so to speak, you're stretching, but you're breathing and your head's supposed to be in a certain space like you would be if you were meditating. So, I mean, do you find it to be meditative for you? Is that like a, a part of meditation yeah. for you? Girl, when I go, um, I <laughs> hope that my instructor doesn't listen to this because she's going to be like, who's a yogi? Um, so, <laughs> but I, I, I started going back to school and so I haven't had the opportunity to go. Um, I found a really great teacher who's a black woman and she's curvy and she's awesome and she like she just talked about what Tamara was talking about where if that's your practice that's your practice there there was times where I was like girl I have nothing to give I'm so exhausted she was like then you take what you need and as soon as the opening chant was done I laid back and went to sleep <laughs> and I had some of the best sleep that I have had in like a few weeks on a hard floor on a mat it was just great so um yeah you know you're in there and you know you're you're moving you you you're sweating and you're holding poses and you know you're just you know you set an intention at the beginning so you and what your intention is I'm going to give it my all I'm going to rest I'm going to be mindful of my space and my body um and so you're meditating the whole time like you know like I I would sit there and like, you know, they'll chant and stuff and, and she'll let you know like what you're chanting. Cause there are people that uh, I can't go in there. I don't know what I'm chanting to I'm like, girl, oh, that's my aunt. <laughs> yeah. I've had, uh, I've had, hope she doesn't hear this. <laughs> right? I've gone with people, other black people who are like, um, I don't, I don't feel comfortable doing that because I only, I only talk to Jesus. Um, and so I'm just like, you know, and so she has stopped and said, she has stopped and said, um, you know, this is what you're saying. Um, and it really is about setting intention and stuff. And so, um, I have sat there with my eyes closed and I have prayed and I have, um, you know, not neglected my, uh, belief system to be in this class. <laughs> um, but it's, it's been helpful for me when I would go, um, and yeah, and it pushes you because I don't fit that yogi stereotype, mm -hmm. um, and the yogi body. And my teacher has been so great because that was intimidating for me as well, because the space, there aren't people that look like us in that space. Mm -hmm. And the only person that looked like me was the instructor. Everybody mm -hmm. else did not. And so it was really intimidating for a, a while. And she would just keep talking me through it. Like you have every right to be here just like they do. Mm -hmm. and you you can do these things too and you you come and it's your practice it's not no one else's so she'll and she'll remind people keep your eyes focused on what you're doing <laughs> because mm -hmm. it's easy to kind of look like I can't put my leg like that you know yeah. so yeah but it's been help it was a, it was very very helpful and during stressful times and good times and um, you know, that reminds me, I should probably try to go back soon, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's been, it was a great experience as far as meditation went for me. Absolutely. Yeah. Part of, part, uh, just to piggyback off of that, part of what mindfulness practices, because people think when you meditate, you're supposed to clear your mind, but your mind right. is never clear. And right. what, what meditation, what you learn is how to observe your thoughts without judgment. Um, right. And without like, uh, it's it's almost like instead of being in the movie of your consciousness, because we tend to just be consumed by what we think and feel, it's like putting it on a television and just observing your thoughts and feelings, mm -hmm. and not and not having a reaction. And so yoga is a is an an amazing time to practice because all those judgments come up and all that, that the, the desire to compare yourself to what other people are doing and, and compare yourself to what you feel you should be doing, or maybe what you used to be able to do and all that mm -hmm. stuff comes up. And so it's, it's a really great way to practice acceptance. Um, it like gives you real world <laughs> application, right? Like how, you know, cause we talk about accepting ourselves and blah, 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 but like it actually gives you something to work with. Like, okay, 
sit here and really be with what's coming up for you in this moment and, mm -hmm. and, um, and honor it and honor where you are. And, and if this is what you have to give, this is what you have to give. And if this is what you need, this is what you need. And mm -hmm. so yoga is, 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 uh, it is meditative. It can be, if you mm -hmm. allow it, if you allow it to be, if you can kind of pull back, um, from thinking of it as something that you're trying to do and just an experience that you're having and a journey that you're on and you're just kind of observing yourself on this journey. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Well, maybe I need to get it together and, and return and try again. I'm, I'm sure I will. Well, look for, I saw in the city, they have yoga classes for um, a, like body positive yoga classes. I've, I've heard seen. that. And, um, yeah. You know, obviously ones for beginners, ones that are, you know, free from, you mean you don't know how to stick your big toe in your ear? Um, I know there are ones. <laughs> what kind of yoga? <laughs> you know, yeah, I know um, and also I, um, someone told me there are um, like meditation apps uh -huh. um, for your phone that, um, she found yeah. really helpful. And um, I, I thought, oh, my gosh, I should look into that. Yeah, I have the Insight Timer yeah. on mine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an app that I found. Yeah, and it's and that's what my yoga teacher told me about. And I downloaded it, and it was great. Well, I'm gonna oh, I, I, I want to try that. Yeah. Sounds Insight good. Timer? Uh-huh. Okay. Well, we're going to put a link to that and a link to Emotional Alchemy. It'll be in the show notes. Ooh. Awesome. Along with any other information about um, um, Tamara and Chioko. Matter of fact, <laughs> my producer just messaged me and says he uses Insight Timer almost every day. <laughs> so, uh, that's awesome, Brent. That, that's, that's dope. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's something... Um, oh, and he says that his son meditates with him. Mm -hmm. Oh, hey, I love that. That's dope. I love that. Yeah, my husband practices Buddhism, and mm -hmm. my son, who's 10, he will stop. I remember he used to play basketball, and people would just get on his nerves because he's not a team sport person. <laughs> and we would try to help him be a team sport person and realize that as he aged, he's more of an individual sport, so like tennis or swimming. Mm -hmm. um, and he would, like, they would, he would come out of the game and sit with his legs crossed and will meditate. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like seven, seven years old, eight, but that was automatic for him. Like things are getting tough. I need to, I need to calm myself down. Mm -hmm. Um, and so he learned that from him is practicing that. So that's hmm. been pretty cool. I might need to do that. Somebody might find me in my cubicle. Just <laughs> in a state. Don't ask me about a form. <laughs> Or any other document, just get away from me. You see, I'm meditating to keep from killing you. <laughs> like that. Well, yeah. Tamara and Jokio, I thank you so very much for wow. coming on today. I think our additional guest, who is Raquel Jones, um, I thank you all for listening to Tackling Tom Poolery yet again. And hopefully you'll be back next week. You better be back next week. Of course. <laughs> Where else would we be? Thank you. Right? <laughs> Thank you. So, Raquel, did you always know you wanted to center Black women and the LGBTQ spectrum? in your work or was that something that happened for you later on? Um, well, I mean, I always knew I wanted to center black women and families, but I worked at different agencies and such. So I did a different type of work, but I knew that when I started my own practice where I was going to be working 
for myself that that's what I wanted to center on because I want to work with you know communities that don't get as much care as they should. And um, you know, the LGBTQ, I wasn't sure if I wanted if I, I was going to be part of my work so much, but actually, it has been. Most of the men I work, I don't work with many men, but men I work with tend to be um, gay men of mm-hmm. color. And um, you know, I have several women who identify as bisexual or as lesbians. So mm-hmm. I think this, I think any community that's somewhat marginalized will seek out someone who they think can understand them better and work with them better. And I think that's probably why they seek me out, which is good because I'm, you know, I want to help everyone to live the best life they can. And how do you, if at all, how do you work um, to sort of help quash the notion black people don't see therapists or black people shouldn't see therapists or therapists is the therapists are for white people. How do you work <laughs> to, you know, get people past that stereotype? You know, almost everyone who seeks me out comes because they want a black woman therapist. I don't know. You know, I don't know if it's so that black people or any people don't, believe in therapy as much as you know when they've gone to see therapists who are white they probably were not treated the right way and so they feel like well this person doesn't understand me so then when they see that they can actually go to someone who has been through things like they have and who can probably understand them better then they just are so happy to have someone who can really relate to them because there is a difference in how you relate. I'm not saying that there are no good white therapists. Of course, sure. I'm sure there are, but they're just, you know, just some things that it's just easier to work with someone who looks like you. I've had, Absolutely. you know, clients tell me things that I know they would not tell a white therapist. And mm-hmm. I just, I know that that's just helps them to have me right there. Even some of the things they'll say, even so, even the language, the way we talk to each other, is just a lot different. Right, not as much pretense, or and not as many walls up because they feel like they're talking to someone who can somehow relate to what they're saying, what they're experiencing, particularly when it comes to cultural matters. Exactly, and I mean, you know, they, you know, you know, we have a, a language that we talk that other people might not understand I don't I don't know how to put that exactly but you know it's just different and also I'm Jamaican also and you know when I have a Jamaican client they just you know they'll feel as comfortable telling me all kinds of stuff that I know they would not yeah. talk that way to a therapist who was not culturally sure. competent in understanding so right right mm-hmm. so as far as what do you what do you do to keep your services affordable do you do like a sliding scale or what do you how do you address the issue of sometimes therapy being something a person might want but can't afford um yes. how do you address that i do have a sliding scale i accept some insurance um and I also work with Open Path Collective, which is a service which matches people with therapists who charge between $30 and $50 for each session. So I have some clients who found me through Open Path, and for them I charge $50 because I'm in New York City, so I can't really charge $30 because that's right. not enough. <laughs> but, you yeah. know, and I, I do have actually one person who I do charge $30 because she's unemployed right now, so... I do charge her less, but, um, yeah, that's how I try to do that. And I try to keep my fee relatively affordable, um, you know, for where I'm located because, you know, I, I wish I could be able to offer less, offer it for less money, but I can't because of the location. Right. And I have to eat and I have to pay my rent. (laughs) Right. Exactly. You know, but I I, I understand. Yeah. yeah, but I understand that it is it can be expensive, so that's why I accept insurance, which because a lot of therapists do not accept insurance. I'm finding, but I do, oh. you know, I accept insurance and I try to be reasonable with my fees. Um, 
And that seems to be working out. My practice is always full. So that's always good. Do you, um, do you think there are benefits to people uh, participating in, say, group therapy, so to speak? I know there are times when insurance will cover, you know, X number of individual um, sessions. And then after that, they're like, well, this is this is where the buck stops. So you can attend this group, <laughs> this group therapy. Okay. We'll fund that. Do you find, I mean, I, I realize it's not the same as the individual um, care that one might receive, but do you think there are benefits to that as well for people who maybe don't have one-on-one therapy money, but they still need some kind mm-hmm. of help? Have you found group therapy can work? Yeah. Um, in my past jobs, I worked, my past physician, I worked at a substance abuse clinic and we did a lot of groups, mostly groups. Um, I do have three groups, which I, um, run right now. Um, one of them is for adolescent girls, which isn't, it's not so big, only three girls in there. So it's a sorry small group. And then I have one group for women who have been sexually abused and as children. And then I have another group, which is a support group for black women called My Sister's Keeper, which is a 12 session group. So we meet for 12 weeks. Then I start over a new session with, you know, with new participants. So I do those groups. And I, yeah, I think it helps to have group there because it, sometimes it's easier to have other people there because, you know, the other people are also experiencing the same thing you do, mm-hmm. you know, because even, you know, just because I'm a black woman doesn't mean I experience everything as every other black woman. Of course, everyone sure. experiences different things. We're not all the same. And I understand that. So, um, you know, by having the groups, you know, the women talk to each other and we relate to each other. And so far it's been good. I, I do think groups are good. Yeah, you know, for some people, but some people, of course, benefit more from individual than from groups. It just depends. Sure. Mm-hmm. Um, now, I know that, um, well, you know, what my understanding is, is that most therapists see a therapist. And mm-hmm. um, so for you, I mean, I assume you probably see someone. Um, I do, yes. Yeah. Um, when you're you know, week in, week out, um, sort of inundated with whatever painful experiences your clients are going through and sharing with you in sessions, does that ever create a drag for you? Do you ever, um, at the end of a work day or work week say, okay, I might need an extra session with my own therapist this week (laughs) because of what I've, you know, um, heard or what I've tried to help with during the course of this work day or work week? Not anymore because I've been doing this for so long. But I mean, when I first started, yes, because I used to work with children at first and you know it was very difficult. And yes, I would have to do that. Now, I think because I've been doing it for so long and I've heard I mean, I've heard everything. I don't know that there's anything that anyone can tell right. me to surprise me anymore. So... Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm usually able to leave it at work. Although there are some clients who I do think about outside of work sometimes Mm -hmm. just because, you know, uh, you know, some people just have that effect where you just think about them and you wonder how they're doing. Um, but usually I'm able to leave it at home, but yes, I do have a therapist though for myself who I talk to. I don't see her every week. I see her every other week or sometimes Mm -hmm. once a month, usually every other week. Um, you know, so we talk, you know, and that helps, I think, to do this work, you really need to have an outlet because you can't talk to your family about right. it. Right. And you can't talk to your friends. And, right. you know, I also have a peer supervision group where I meet we- weekly. We meet uh, me and some other therapists and we discuss our clients and stuff like that. And, you know, okay. we talk about yeah. what's going on with each other. I imagine that would be helpful just to be able to, you know, bounce off ideas and experiences with other people who are, you know, in your field. Mm-hmm. Oh, nice. Okay. Well, 
if there was, you know, a piece of advice, um, just as a therapist from your, from your professional perspective that you'd want to give to black women, what would it be? Oh, goodness. That's a, (laughs) that's a tough question. So many things. (laughs) Hey, if you want to name more than one thing, that's fine. (laughs) Okay. First, we need to stop settling and realize that we deserve to be treated as well as any other woman and stop settling for whatever, just so that you, to say that you have somebody. That's one thing <laughs> that we need to stop doing. N- number two, we need to stop buying into this idea that we always have to be strong and that we're not allowed to cry and we're not allowed to be upset and all of that because we are allowed to do that just like anyone else. Um, and number three, just we have to just remember that we're worthy of everything just like anyone else and not believe that we're not and that anyone, that other races of women are better than us or that we need to pretend that we're like these other women or whatever. And, you know, you just have to be who you are. And I know, you know, a lot of my clients are young women, mostly are young women who are in corporate work- workplaces and it's hard to do that and just you know you know don't stop being your authentic self just because of where you have to work you still have you can still be who you are you know and my other advice is if you want to have a weave it's okay (laughs) (laughs) don't let these men tell you not to have a weave or a wig or that means that you're (laughs) self-hating yourself or whatever the hell they say i'm sorry (laughs) that just gets to me sometimes when they do that like you know, you have your hair however you want. It does not mean that you hate yourself. You can have your hair natural, relaxed, with a weave, a wig, whatever. And you don't, you know, don't listen to these people telling you that that means that means anything other than that's what you want to do. <laughs> and just keep awesome advice. Yes, and just love yourself because, you know, we're beautiful and everyone wants to be us, but they won't say that. Mm -hmm. you are so very right so very right well Raquel thank you so much for taking time out to do this with me of course Um, and hopefully in the future um, you'll come back um, and race us again thank you so much anytime I'd love you know I love talking (laughs) on these sort of things so it's not a problem I'd love to do it again anytime ready you're welcome have a good day. Tackling Tomfoolery is produced by Bryn Inman for Square People Media. For more information or for comments and conversation, find us on the web at tacklingtomfoolery.org, the Tackling Tomfoolery podcast on Facebook, Tackling Tomfoolery on Twitter, and Tackling Tom Fool on Instagram. To subscribe to the podcast, Go to Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, or SoundCloud, and please make sure you review the show because it helps others find us. If you'd like to contact us, email us at tacklingtomfoolery at gmail or leave us a voicemail at 916-573-1065 and let us know what tomfoolery you're tackling. You can also donate to the podcast via Patreon at patreon.com forward slash tacklingtomfoolery. Let's get it.